everyone. Welcome to Privacy Now. I'm Mike Fibus. Now that wearables are more capable, they're being used more and more in medical studies. Like, for example, Fitbit's All of Us study with the National Institutes of Health, which is exploring different relationships between our, our lifestyles and our well-being. Now, data from this and other studies typically is de-identified to keep others from getting into our medical records. But as our online digital footprint grows, it's getting more and more difficult to keep nosy marketers, insurers, and others from connecting the dots to figure out which data is yours and which data is mine. So how difficult is this to do? And what's being done about it? Here to talk about this and other issues, we're fortunate to have with us today Laura Peary, who is Head of Global Privacy at Fitbit. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mike, for having me. Yeah, so this re-identification issue is getting a lot of play lately. Just how does someone go about doing that? To provide a little bit of context for, for this issue, um, data from wearables like Fitbit um, are, offer incredible value to health research and um, helping people live healthier lives. Um, however, fit, this health research often involves multiple parties, including academic institutions, research organizations, government, um, and private industry. And um, um, with these multiple parties, um, it's important to be proactive in making sure that the privacy of, of users who participate in research studies is, um, is protected. And um, one of the ways that Fitbit is going about doing that is raising awareness of some of the privacy risks that can come about, particularly the de-identification risk um, that you mentioned. Um, and we address this um, in, our, in our research pledge. So what can happen is that there can be a, uh, a privacy risk of unintended re-identification of research participants. So this can happen when researchers publish the data sets that underlie their study outcomes. So these data sets um, that get published, the researchers may take steps to protect privacy by removing identifiers like a user's name. Um, but even with those precautions, it still may be possible to link the data sets back to an identified individual that participated in the research if that data um, set includes data that the individual has chosen to share publicly elsewhere. So let me give you a specific example. Um, some Fitbit users choose to share their daily active step counts publicly on Twitter. Um, if these users' daily step counts is also included in the researcher's published data set, then that user could be re-identified in the research study based on this information, even if their name is not included. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is a key privacy risk that, the, um, that our recently published research pledge seeks to address. Um, so we have requirements in there that provide that researchers that um, are looking to publish, we, we specify that they um, consider publishing only aggregated data to try to eliminate that risk altogether. Um, however, if they um, choose to publish data that is not aggregated in which um, identifiers have been removed, um, we suggest that they take certain steps to protect against that re-identification risk. So for example, have statisticians certify that the published data set's been sufficiently de-identified de to protect, um, protect our users' reasonable expectations of privacy when they, when they participate in these research studies. Now, you bring up a, a really good point. I mean, I don't think folks have thought about their step counts as sort of a digital fingerprint. But if you think about it, uh, you know, the individual amount of steps I've taken over the past week is probably just me, if not very many others. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be very much a unique data point that's specific to an individual, especially if you have many of those data points over time. And, and some of our Fitbit users have been publishing their daily step counts to Twitter over a particularly extended period of time. And that, that becomes something that is very much like a digital fingerprint, like you mentioned. Yeah, so it, I, I think the challenge over time as our, our digital online footprint grows 
is uh, how do you decide what to share? I mean, five years ago, sharing your step counts, you know, definitely wouldn't have associated you with much of anything else. And now that's not so true anymore. At, at Fitbit, we found that social sharing of your health and wellness goals and your progress towards those goals has been key to helping people stay on track and, and better meet those goals. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, our users might choose to share their daily active step count to, to Twitter. It's an accountability measure and it helps, them, it helps them meet their goals and it helps them live healthier lives. So that's a, that's a very positive reason for people to share. Uh, what we're looking to avoid with the research pledge is unintended consequences, which is that someone who, who engages in those, those habits that, that help them meet their, their step, count, um, step count goals isn't unintentionally re-identified if they choose to participate in a research study. Um, and so one of our goals with the research pledge was to raise awareness of that risk um, through working with our, our partners in the research community by providing them with this guidance um, that provides that they need to take account this particular risk. Um, so we're looking to protect against this risk um, through raising awareness in the, in the research community. And, and I can say that ahead of, ahead of publishing the research pledge, we did a lot of outreach with the research community. And there is, you know, and there wasn't a single research partner that we spoke to who um, wasn't absolutely committed to protecting the privacy of their research participants. This is simply um, an awareness issue and, and something that they just needed to be, to understand better so that they could um, take better privacy measures when they are publishing their their data sets. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. I mean, this is not a community of bad actors. They are undertaking studies to, to better our health and our understanding of the variables in the first place. So so you're starting out with a, a good pool. Um, yes. What yes, other yes. what other things are you recommending to them besides, uh, you know, like a qualified expert to look at the data? Um, so there's a whole series of, um, of, of requirements that we have in our research pledge and they, they address this risk of de-identification, but they also cover a number of best practices for privacy that we expect from researchers. They, they span um, issues of obtaining informed consent. So ensuring that research subjects are given enough information about the research that enable them to make an informed and voluntary decision to participate in the research. Um, they include requirements that a research study has to be reviewed or approved by in, an independent ethics review board. Um, they include guidance on appropriate data use limitations to help respect the privacy and autonomy of research subjects. So, so for example, you know, minimize the data that you collect, um, you know, collect only the data that, that um, you need for the purposes that are specified in um, the consent um, that you get from users. Um, we have um, provisions in there around giving research subjects control over their personal data. That includes the ability to withdraw from a research study at any time, which should include an option to delete their personal data or at a minimum remove it from, from future research studies. Um, and then we have standards around maintaining appropriate data security. <clears throat> okay, that makes sense. In general, share as little as possible. Although in many cases, the research community evaluates uh, each other, which in many cases requires the data. So uh, they don't always control where it, where it goes, although it's more researchers. So it's, it's, that's at least helpful. Right. I mean, so in terms of guidance for how to mitigate the risk of re-identification, um, we've provided a number of different approaches. Um, so as I, you know, as I mentioned, um, wherever possible, we rec 
recommend using summary level aggregate data rather than individual level de-identified data that could be linked back to a user, for example, with a unique step count over, over time. Um, however, we do recognize that, um, that researchers may share their underlying data sets um, in order for um, other research to, researchers to engage in peer review of their research conclusions. So um, one of the suggestions that we provide in our research pledge is that instead of publishing the data publicly to just provide it selectively to the others that need it for peer review, subject to contractual commitments that um, they agree not to disclose or attempt to re-identify the data. Um, and as a last resort, we suggest that if you have to publish individual um, de-identified data publicly, that, we, that, um, that the researchers do so, of course, in compliance with all, all applicable laws, um, and also use a accepted de-identification um, technique. Um, so one of them that what we discussed was an expert determination that the risk of re-identification is very small or, or another technique may be differential privacy. Um, so this is the, the, last, the last resort if the data must be published publicly. Right. <clears throat> differential privacy seems to be uh, something that a lot of folks are, are turning to to, uh, to solve this issue. And, how and how effective is that now, and how long do you think that will that will hold? Well, um, I mean, it's it's great that industry is is um, devoting resources to um, to these kinds of techniques and helping to standardize them. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's um, you know when when using these techniques, it's important to make sure that you have someone who's appropriately expert in applying them. Um, and then um, also make sure that you're aware of all of the different um, risk vectors, right? And so um, the role that Fit, Fitbit has, has taken with publishing the research pledges to make sure that, um, that the researchers who um, maybe engaging experts to apply standards like differential privacy are aware of the particular risk factor that we we are concerned about, which is the um, pu public sharing of Fitbit activity data. Right, right. That makes sense. Have you uh, noticed with any of uh, these other data sets besides besides Fitbit counting steps that uh, have increased the re risk for re-identification? Um, I mean, it is possible for users to share other types of information. The most commonly shared um, metric is the step count um, through our privacy settings. Um, however, it is possible. It could it could very well be possible that other that users could choose to share other metrics publicly as well. In, in which case, um, a researcher or, or whoever's applying the de-identification technique um, and certifying it should take that into consideration. Right. Now, you had mentioned some of these uh, techniques. Now, the, uh, there are standards and, and regulations in place. Increasingly, though, as folks triangulate, that's, we're kind of outpacing you know, what's required now, isn't, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, you, ra you raise a good point. So um, there's, um, a, there's a standard that is um, provided, a data identification standard that's provided in HIPAA, the um, Health Insurance Portability Account and Accountability Act. Um, and there's a safe harbor standard that provides that if you remove 18 um, different identifiers and if you have no actual knowledge of any um, residual risk that the data set um, could be linked to an individual, that that's considered to be sufficiently uh, de-identified under the HIPAA standard. Um, and what the research pledge is looking to do is um, raise awareness that, that simply removing identifiers may not be enough in and of itself and that, that to appropriately protect privacy, it's important to consider these other public data sets that may be available and how they might be linked um, to your published data set. So it is, an, it is um, 
one may one could potentially say it goes beyond the HIPAA de-identification standard. Although what we're really looking to do is kind of raise awareness that um, that certain kinds of applications of that HIPAA standard um, may not protect people's privacy expectations when they participate in research studies. Right, and so I mean, at the very least, I think you had said the the uh, the pledge is at least raising awareness. I, I think most folks in healthcare assume that uh, if I meet HIPAA, I am covered, and that's just not the case anymore. Yeah, so um, with the, with if, if someone's applying HIPAA to only remove those 18 identifiers, it's absolutely the case that, that there may be a meaningful privacy risk that remains, and the research pledge is looking to address that. Yeah. Now, you've been at uh, Fitbit, what, a couple of years now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A little over two years now. And this position was created specifically, I mean, you, nobody was uh, a predecessor. You're the first one in this job, right? It's true. Um, so, I mean, privacy has long been part of Fitbit's DNA. I mean, our, our mission is to help people reach their, their health and wellness goals by empowering them with data. And privacy is critical to that. Um, and and um, as, as part of our mission, we've been building control over people's um, data you know, into our product experience from the very beginning. So privacy, you know, designing the product with privacy in mind has been, has been central from the beginning. With the creation of my role, um, I re- the, the, the vision was to bring our, um, our privacy culture to the next level with a formalized privacy program that enables our, our privacy design and privacy culture to scale. Um, as well as to meet new and evolving regulatory requirements. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really critical. It's a fine line to walk when you're, when you're collecting to intimate detail. I mean, uh, to look at how it hasn't worked, I mean, you can look at some of the DNA testing, for example. Obviously, a lot of intimate detail, and I think, you know, folks over the past year or so have been a little disappointed that uh, that data wasn't isn't quite so secure as they might have thought. So yeah, it's integral to your business too. It's not just good practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been very aware that the data that we collect is is very personal and you know, in, in some cases, sensitive data. And so uh, as a result, privacy has been core to our business from the beginning. <clears throat> yeah, right, that, that makes sense. So I, we're just about out of time, Laura. What can't you believe I forgot to ask you? <laughs> um, well, um, you could you could ask us about um, our sort of historical approaches to um, uh, privacy with our partners. So, for example, um, the research pledge is not a new approach for Fitbit to working with with partners on proactive solutions to protect privacy. It, it follows our earlier wellness pledge, um, which protects the data privacy of our corporate wellness customers. So, um, if you're not familiar with this. Fitbit product offering, employers can offer their employees benefits like Fitbit devices and opportunities to participate in step challenges as way to, ways to encourage healthy behaviors. Um, so this is another example of, um, of sharing of, of Fitbit data that can have really positive health outcomes for people. Um, yet it's also another area where um, vigilance and privacy is incredibly important. So. Um, we set out in our earlier wellness pledge um, a set of standards that corporate wellness programs should always be inclusive, always be voluntary, and always protect the privacy of the people that they that they aim to serve. Okay, excellent. And thank you so much for your time, Laura. This was great. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike, for having me. And thank you all for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>